does my character know what the ocean is? And then Bria's saying, I don't know, bitch. Have you seen the ocean? <laughs> I I laugh so hard at that because that is like something I would say. Where I would be like, I don't know. Oh, you should know this. <laughs> Faster Purple Worm Kill Kill. This episode is a shock compared to all of the others, which is a lot to say because all of the episodes are shocking. I'm very excited to talk to you about this, Jasmine, and break it down. I think my first question is, as a like DM, how how is this different going into a game knowing you have to complete a full story in an hour and that it's going to end in a TPK? It's very different. It's very different. Normally, um... I am a very chaotic uh, dungeon master uh, because I I don't ever have like set points in my story. Um, I I will even change things drastically compared like based off of what my players are reacting to or what they're excited about. Um, and uh, it, it's it's quite funny. Michael Schaubach, who's uh, the director of Dimension Twenty, and he's in every season of Dimension Twenty, but he also does Desi Quest. Uh, often says in that regard of all the DMs he's worked with and he's worked with some of the greatest, he says, I'm like a poet. Uh, and for this, I had to kind of put on my my engineer pants a little bit of, okay, there is a certain place that our characters need to start and there's a place where they need to end, which is dead. And in the middle, we get to need to, we have to get to know these people so that we care about that ending. And what are, you know, how am I going to ensure that each player gets that moment before the end? So the prep going in was definitely like a gauntlet of interactions, if that makes sense, that would allow us to get to know a little bit more about where these people are so that we care about this village, but also who these people are so that we care about them when they die. Um, and of course, I knew that we had a funny cast so that the jokes would happen regardless. Can you talk to me a little bit about your NPC, Cora? Because I thought that was a really good way of immediately ingratiating us to the other players. It's funny. My NPC work is a something that I've kind of become to be a little known for. Um, I think, you know, different DMs have different strong suits. And I never plan an MPC that's going to be very well liked by the players, the audience, but somehow it does happen. And I needed to have like a common thread between all the players who it was kind of going to be the audience's eyes in a sense that like through Cora's eyes, we can see their impression of every player and therefore help inform the audience's impression of every player. Um, and so, yeah, I uh, created this, this character and... Um, I think I'm, I'm trying to remember Matthew Lillard's character's name, but I think we learned so much about him just from the two interacting that, uh, she definitely did what I need, needed her to do. Um, sorry, I'm bad at talking, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I think the NPC's jobs are to, um, allow the players to, almost like hold a mirror to themselves because it's my way as a DM of kind of being like, this is my impression of your character sheet. And this is this NPC's impression of your character sheet. What do you think? And sometimes it's correct and sometimes it's incorrect, but either way, it's always very enlightening. Speaking of Matthew Lillard, what was it like having him play at the table with you as one of the creators of the game? Or it was so nostalgic. It was so nostalgic because I got, I haven't played with Matthew since Relics and Rarities, um, which Deborah and Wall DM that game. And I remember the first day he came on set. It's like he elevated the energy and he was just like, he's playing this dragonborn with a Scottish accent. And uh, that was like my first, I think, like, like real TTRPG production. And um, I remember being like, I want to get there someday. I want to be that person that like storms onto set and everybody gets excited to play D and D because this person's just like got have such a strong performance. Um, and it was amazing because uh, we, him and I, had a few moments during the show where we were just kind of uh, monologuing at each other. And it's one of my favorite things I've ever done in D&D because I finally felt like I got to have that moment where we both get to like 
are, you know, me as a, as a dungeon master, as an NPC and him as a character get to like make eye contact and just like go big, like just have a really big performance and chew the scenery a little bit. And, uh, I loved it. I loved it. I love working with him. He's such a magnetic person and his love for the game really always comes through. Every time I've been in anything with him, his love for D&D like comes through. Speaking of those monologues, I have to talk to you too about your Demogorgon because I think you had the scariest villain monologue we've seen so far in the show. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah, I love horror. Horror is my is my like favorite uh, genre of, of, of tabletop RPG, I should say. And so um, when you have a two-headed creature, I feel like you have to lean into that. And I loved the idea of the two heads just sort of discussing all the horrible things they're going to do to the players and arguing about, um, you know, how they were going to do it. Uh, kind of in the same way that... Um, the trolls are discussing how they're going to eat the hobbits in in Lord of the Rings. I I wanted that, but a little darker. I also realized pretty quickly that the characters are very low level, and they're fighting these these very iconic D and D villains that have usually pretty good initiative roles. I didn't want people to die before they got to do something in battle. Um, but I also didn't want to fudge the roles. So instead, I just, I think if I remember correctly, I just have the Demogorgon argue with itself while the players kind of just dance around its feet like ants because it is so unconcerned, so wholly unconcerned with them. And I was like, oh, this is perfect. This is going to be amazing. And the players will get to do something before they get, you know, smashed into jelly by this magnificent creature. Um and that's kind of how <laughs> that is kind of how it went. I'm glad you enjoyed it. That makes me really happy. Um, yeah, I love the Demogorgon. I want to put them in an actual campaign now, but it's like a, like a longer form campaign. I shouldn't, I shouldn't say actual, but something longer form that isn't a one shot. But I've honestly never gotten players that have gotten high high level enough uh, to fight a legit Demogorgon. So it hasn't it hasn't happened yet. Maybe one day it will, and we'll get to see the the two heads argue again fingers crossed we get there i <laughs> love that you brought up horror because i was curious i'm a big dimension 20 fan and coffin run is amazing so i was curious if that kind of horror comedy that you had done before came into play when you were on fast perform i am a big believer of the what is the age-old saying that the difference between horror and comedy is the speed at which everything happens yeah I'm a, I'm a big believer in that. I think uh, horror naturally becomes comedy. Um, and at least, and, and sometimes our reactions to, um, you know, horrifying events can be laughter, which I, which I also think is fun. And so um, I never uh, go into a campaign thinking, oh, I'm going to scare my players. I always go in thinking I'm going to set the atmosphere or this is my goal of, of what I want them to imagine. And if that reaction is fear, that's great. But if that reaction is nervous laughter or cracking a joke or saying my character lets out a nervous fart, I'm never opposed to that. Um, I'm also on Seattle by night and with the, with, the, with the Ack Inc. and the Penny Arcade crew and Jason Carl GMs that... And it's, 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 I, I almost wonder, like, I, I often want to ask him about what it's like to, to GM, like a very serious version of that game with, with uh, LA by night, New York by night, and then come to a coterie that all of us kind of crack jokes when we're nervous, like all of us do. And so I think this has always come like really naturally to me. Cough and Run was a season that I pitched because I knew I was like, oh yeah, like I could do like this sort of camp, a uh, horror camp really well. Um, and then knowing that and coming into this, I was like, yeah, I think we could do it again. I think we could do a, <laughs> a sequel to that in a way. My friend and I still quote moments from Coffin Run at each other. <laughs> it was a, it was a fun, it was a fun show to do. And in a lot of ways it changed my life because I, I got to meet the people, like so many people that I'm still working with now. And, um, I loved 
I, I'm so addicted to like short form mm-hmm. stuff now of doing like a six episode run or a 10 episode run that my brain is constantly drumming around with ideas for other seasons, you know, where I'm like, so Dimension 20, call me. I've got, I've got like 10 in the chamber because <laughs> I think short form is such a cool, like the idea of like, there is a set end. I think you get to do concepts you couldn't do in long form. I think a lot of people think of the limitations, but I think of all the advantages of being able to do something with short form. Speaking of some of the people you're working with still, uh, Anjali Bamani is in this and we get to see her in Desi Quest as well. Can you talk about working with her on Purple Worm and Desi Quest? Yes, it's working with Anjali has been probably like the greatest gift of the last year. We always knew each other. We were always friendly. Um, We met on the set of Critical Role for a Doom one shot. We were both had demon makeup, which is hilarious. Um, And immediately, like, she was just so warm to me. And she was like, who are you? Let's let's be friends, basically. And um, over the past year, you know, we brought her on as an executive producer on Desi Quest. um, And... We've just gotten so close. I feel like she's my big sister. I learned so much from her. And anytime she's on set, I always feel confident. Like my my pre-tape jitters are gone because she'll always like put a hand on my shoulder and tell me like, hey, you're really good at this. And anytime you tell stories, like I feel privileged to be at the table, I would come sit here any time of the week. She's like, I would pay money to sit at that table. And it's always great going into a game where you don't necessarily know everyone, knowing that you have one person at the table that is going to cheerlead whatever you do and is um, kind of like there to to make you shine. And so um, I love Anjali. And I always know that I can throw anything at her and she's going to come out with like the greatest performance, the greatest tear jerking performance you've ever seen. I could not agree more. And let me second her point. You are fantastic at this. <laughs> thank you thank you so much what was it like to have a uh, first time player at the table with michael Irby? michael Irby is fantastic and what really the thing with first time players is making sure they're around uh examples to that to can show them what they can do because sometimes with dungeons and dragons the scariest thing really is is that a lot of players because There's so many options. They don't really understand what the options are. So a lot of times with new players, um, I will kind of remind them or give them options. And it's not to railroad them. It's just to let them kind of get them thinking in a direction. And it's it's really funny because uh, there was a moment towards the end of the episode where uh, Michael Irby was like, I... Can I can I give my turn to someone else because I don't know what to do here? And I actually paused the game and I gently said, I was like, you're going to die. But this is your moment to kind of decide the conditions under which you go out. I think you want to do this yourself. And it was amazing because once he understood that, he took a beat and immediately came out with like the greatest stuff ever. And I think with new players, it's important to give them options. You're not railroading them. Like with an experienced player, you know, I think it's, you probably, I I still give advice. I'm one of those DMs. Um, But you know, it's probably less, more frowned on to be like, well, you could attack this creature. You could try to convince this creature not to fight you. Um, You could try to intimidate it or persuade it, or you could try to flee just so you know, fleeing is going to be very difficult because of these factors. So I've always DM'd like that. Um, and I do that with first time players too. I just really lay out the the conditions and kind of let them know um, what their options are. And so usually that gets them thinking and then they'll say, well, if I, if, instead of running, could I, could I hide? And they start to immediately kind of draw these like pathways and um, yeah, that's, that's, you can honestly, I think you could teach anyone to play D and D, um, as long as they have some sense of improv and a lot of actors do kind of know what improv is. And so that helps a lot. I've actually probably had more difficulty, uh, with first time players that don't understand the concept of, of improv and, um, but they still learn, they still learn it. Usually it's just, there's a lot more, uh, hesitation where they're like, so this 
this innkeeper is talking to me? Yes. Do I talk back? I I mean, ideally. (laughs) Okay. Could I say I'm from this other place? You could. Is that true? I I don't know. You tell me. (laughs) I think my favorite was um, Amy Carrero uh, asking uh, Abria on EXU, has my character... Does my character know what the ocean is? And I'm saying, I don't know, bitch. Have you seen the ocean? <laughs> I I laugh so hard at that because that is like something I would say. I would be like, I don't know. Oh, you should know this. I love EXU. Amy Carrero, that is just insanity and chaos. And I love it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's fun. And of course, like I'm a big fear of rice stand. I watch, I try to watch everything Anjali's in if I can, because um, she's just so, she's just such a peach and she's always so excited about whatever she's just worked on. That's like the greatest thing about her. She'll always like come running and be like, I just did this and it's so good. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to try to watch it. I'm going to try to watch at least a few episodes. <laughs> All right. It's like, I don't have the time to watch all of them because actual plays are so long. Actual plays are really long, which is kind of what I liked about the Faster Purple Worm format. I'm like, okay, people can watch this and they can rewatch it. Like it's it's so short. Um, So as much as the format is a challenge, it's everything I write, everything I do, I do for the players and the audience, you know? Um... I think this is because I come from the game developer side because I write for video games now. And I think I'm always thinking about the end user every single time where I'm like, I want to make a game that I would want to play, that the game gamer would want to play, you know? If I'm not doing this for them, who am I doing it for? And uh, even with Desi Quest, the idea was always like, what is the Desi show that would have gotten me into D&D? Um, and I know that some people look down on that where they're like, oh, well, we're just five friends at a table. I very much am like, this is a show. And what message am I trying to connect to the audience? What do I want them to take away from this? And how do I want them to feel? And yeah, we're friends and yeah, we're at a table, but this isn't a home game. If it was a home game, we would be eating Doritos and, uh, you know, like, uh, cursing every time we rolled poorly and um, fighting each other over trading dice and stuff like that, right? Um, and maybe there is a space for that type of a game too, but I, I definitely do treat it like a show. And I think, um, oh my God, I think I've just gotten so into the reads on this, but I think with Faster Purple Worm, I didn't look at it as like, how do you tell a story in an hour? I definitely looked at it more as like, that's a challenge, but the end result is a show that our audience can actually not feel intimidated getting into. Yeah. Like it's a bunch of one shots. If you miss one episode, you can watch the next one. They're short. You can, you know, like I, I don't have to feel bad about asking my friends to go watch this thing. Cause it's not 30 hours of content, you know, like, so there was all the shows I do. I try to keep the episodes under 90 minutes. It's like my personal, my personal goal because I can't watch three hour shows. I don't have that kind of time. I mean, I've got Fargo to watch. (laughs) There's a new season. John Hamm is in it, you know? (laughs) So I I can't be doing all this and also, (laughs) and also watching three hour episodes for all my friends every week. So actually like how accessible faster purple worm is that is one of my favorite parts as well and then what was it like playing with the live studio audience not only like watching with the energy amp up but being actively involved in decisions made during the game that was such a cozy spot for me i i actually hate when there's no live audience um i recently got my my dream gig of being on acquisitions incorporated which was the first podcast I ever listened to before I even like really knew what D&D was. I remember listening to this, this podcast with, with Jerry and Mike and Will, and I got to play with Will on an episode of Faster Perform. It was very full circle for me. Um, but when, and, and Scott and, and when Jerry reached out and asked me to come be on Ack Inc., I, at first I was like excited, but then I was like nervous where I was like, oh my God, that's a lot of people. Because they always those shows are always packed, you know. This last one at Unplugged, we had to turn people away. The room was so packed, and 
I was so nervous about doing live D and D where I'm like, there's no cutting. Everything you say is like, it's just out there. It's canon. If you make a mistake or make a tactically poor choice or get somebody killed, that's just, that just happened. You can't take it back. And, but I've since learned since doing it now for, for a year, you always, you can always adjust for how the audience is feeling that night because you're getting instant feedback. So I feel like I'm more confident. If you make a joke, you know, immediately whether or not it's landed, um, you know what they're enjoying, you know, if they are more into the combat this time, if they're more into the role play this time, you can tell which interact, what kind of interactions they like, what kind of interactions they don't like. Do they like it when the players kind of roast each other and rib each other? Or do they like it more when everyone it's like, it's more full house. You can kind and you can kind of adjust on the fly and having a live audience, like once again, it didn't feel like I was like recording something and casting it into the void. I kind of knew in real time what was working, what wasn't working and like rapidly being able to adjust that. And so we kind of get a glimpse into what viewers of the show are going to think versus making the show, editing the show, releasing the show and then going to the comments and being like, I thought this episode was funny, but apparently it's really boring. <laughs> <laughs> it allows you to like fix it before it becomes the show. So I, I loved it. And I want to talk to you about something that happened in the game that we talked about a little bit before the interview. Uh, Omega made a decision that was you, not necessarily expected decision of kind of putting all the players to sleep with the intention of having them not feel pain mm -hmm. when they were killed by the Demogorgon. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because I know it surprised you because it surprised me when I was watching. Yeah, yeah. It did surprise me a little bit. Um, and I think this is one of those cases where it's we we look at this this same sort of, I guess, like game or storytelling very differently. In my mind, when you're collaborative storytelling, you kind of have to allow for people having a very different take on a situation than you do. Um, but you also have to honor everyone else's decision making at the table. You have to honor people's decisions for themselves, but you also want to honor everyone else's agency at the table and allow them to dictate at least the important, like the big story beats of, of their characters' lives, I guess. And so, um, yeah, I think... I think Omega was definitely justified in being like, this is how I want to go out. But then I just orchestrated events to make sure that um, that wasn't necessarily how the rest of the party went out. Um, I think that when things like this happen at the table, the biggest tool is really like communication, stopping the game, talking above table, uh, you know, pausing the game and taking a moment to be like, I, I don't know that I'm okay with that. Or I think this might be uh, narratively something I'm not trying to do. And I, before I got into this space, I actually worked at a game store for, for, for a few years. And I listened to every game <laughs> of Edge of the Empire and D&D &D and Mouse Guard that was played at the tables of my store, you know, because I was there stuck at the register and I would just hear the players uh, talk. And I think the difference between the players that... Uh, grab their stuff, flip over the DM screen, screen, flip everyone off and leave. And the groups that keep going for eight or nine months is um, the ability to say, hey, 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 I'm not torturing this guard. Like I, as a human being, I'm not doing that. If we're doing that, I don't want to be a part of it. I'm really sorry, guys. I'm not okay with this. And the rest of the table being able to be like, okay, let's, let's take a beat. Let's figure out how we want to do this. And other people, I think like the, 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 the groups that don't make it are the groups that are like, uh, aren't able to have that conversation because it's hard. I'm an introvert. Having that conversation is hard. But I think when you're playing a game like D&D &D and people say, well, it's just a game. It is a game, but it's a game. Sometimes you've been playing for like months and years and acting like you don't have any investment in it is wild. And like I said, when you're collaborative storytelling and someone else takes the wheel and starts to steer this thing you've all built together, the ship you've all built together onto maybe some choppy water, of course, you're going to feel a type, of, a type of way about it. And every time people have that retort of like, I don't know why we need to have these conversations or make it this deep. It's just a game. And I'm like, yes. And what are games supposed to be? Fun. So if it's in the interest of, of fun, 
and making sure people are having fun, then yeah, those conversations are worth having instead of hand waving them away and saying, well, it's just a game. And so I think um, that that interaction uh, reminded me of that because I could immediately see that some of the players were unhappy. And I was like, I took a beat and I was like, I'm going to fix this. And then I fixed it. And I, I tried to find a compromise between honoring what Omega wanted for their character and honoring what the rest of the players wanted for their characters. Yeah, very good balancing act. And you definitely pulled it off. I also think it's hilarious that people say it's just a game because I'm like, what is D&D if not like therapy for players at this point? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, people start working out stuff in these games big time big time you're gonna lend yourself to argument anytime you're working on something together um i think this is why there's so many reddit threads of people uh complaining about group projects i don't think it's because (laughs) i don't think it's because group projects are pleasant i think it's because even well-meaning people with a common goal will have very different takes on how to get to that final product and you're going to butt heads and you're going to feel like someone else isn't doing what they're supposed to do or, or you would rather do what they're doing. And the same thing, D and D is a group project. You all know that you're going to play this game. You all know that there's a broad story you're going to tell, but people might have different ideas of how that story is going to go. It's often why I say like Baldur's Gate three wouldn't work as a campaign. This is my spicy take of the day. And a lot of people are like, well, wh- wh- why? And I'm like, if I was playing a dark urge and I bit off Gail's hand in a game, I know there would be somebody else at the table that was like T- too far, you know, like, I can't believe you did that. Like those types of huge swings only work with people that either one you've been playing with for a long, long time. And you all know, kind of know what time it is where you're all going to play these like murderers, I guess. Or number two, um, I guess like it, it, a game that is centered on you and everyone kind of understands that like, you know, this is your backstory and we're supporting cast. Um, but yeah, there's like decisions I've made in, in Baldur's Gate where I'm like, we would have had to hold the council of Elrond for me to decide to do this in a D&D campaign because what I'm about to do is actually quite monstrous. <laughs> but when you're playing the Dark Urge... Sometimes you eat a bard. I don't, you know, like it happened. There's no use crying over <laughs> spilt bard. Sorry about spoilers. <laughs> There's no use crying over a spilt bard. There's no, it happened. It was probably a bear. We don't even know that it was me. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. I love that. I love the immediate. I may have not done it. Well, no one knows. There's no witnesses. <laughs> what happens beyond a reasonable doubt? <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Oh my gosh. Um, bringing it back to Faster Purple Worm because I do need to be able to talk. And I feel like <laughs> if you just tell me what you're doing in Baldur's Gate, I'll just be laughing for the next 30 minutes. <laughs> my Baldur's Gate playthrough is unhinged. So yes, I <laughs> made choices in that game. <laughs> I want to talk to you about that so bad after the interview. <laughs> uh, but what is something about Fast and Purple Worm and that experience, both as a player and a DM, because you've been on both sides of the screen, that you want to take into future games? I think it was like the the scale of folks involved, you know, like I think Faster Purple Worm is um, kind of inspiring, you know, now that I own my own project, this Quest, like seeing how they took what was like a live show format because they were doing these shows live at Guildhall, I think. And then like taking that on the road, doing it at different conventions and eventually using that as like a prototype for a show and continuing to kind of like have this like brand um, and have this project that involves so many people across like so many different parts of the hobby. Because when you look at the list of the folks involved in Purple Worm and the people who've got to play and run games, it's a massive list. And it's just fun. It's just fun. I don't, I can't say for sure that I would have gotten a chance to play with Seth Green and Will Wheaton, you know, if I hadn't, if I hadn't been a part of this project or, or Michael Irby, uh, for that matter. And so I think it's, it's so cool that like Matt has kind of used the goodwill he has in this industry to make a project that involves so many different people and then tour that. 
And um, it's definitely inspired me to be like, instead of looking at a show as like one season of something you put on one platform of like, well, if this works, what, what does the live show version of that look like? What does an anthology of stories set in that world looks like and look like I should say. And, um, being okay with letting other DMS like have their spin on that and, and kind of, you know, um, contribute to that because their take on this is going to be really, really different. And I think that's been the wildest thing about seeing some of the episodes is how different, even though we all were given the same premise, how different our takes on that same premise were. And yeah, I think that's, I think that's like my biggest takeaway is like, sometimes you, you build a boat and you let other people drive it once in a while and you try to fit as many people as you can on board. And then that project becomes something like so much bigger because of the scope and the talents of the people involved. And so I think that was very inspiring. Well, like I said before, you are fantastic on Fast Purple Worm. Congratulations on Desi Quest. And I really hope we see those seasons you've kicking around in your head on Dimension 20. <laughs> I hope so too. <laughs> thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me today. Of course. Thank you.